afternoon. Uh, my name is Robert Holub. I'm Dean of the Undergraduate Division in the College of Letters and Science, and welcome to Berkeley Writers at Work. Um, over the past 25 years that I've been on campus, I've introduced uh, many speakers in different forms. Um, and I can tell you that it's a very happy situation when you can introduce a speaker to an audience whose book you've just read and enjoyed so much, and that's the case today. David Kirk is a graduate of Amherst College and Harvard Law School. He's written over a dozen books on a great variety of topics, on higher education, on AIDS, on community in the United States. He's published articles in leading journals in various fields in education, law, and public policy, as well as um, uh, writing for uh, various more popular periodicals, such as the New York Times, Harper's, and the Atlantic Monthly. He's been a guest on numerous uh, radio and television shows as well, including the Jim Lair News Hour, Good Morning America, and Geraldo. He's also been a guest uh, on several uh, different um, programs on NPR. Now, Professor Kirp is not only a prolific writer and a veritable academic celebrity, uh, he's also a fine teacher and a recognized advocate of human rights. He's the recipient of uh, Berkeley's Distinguished Teaching Award, the highest award that we give on the campus for uh, classroom teaching, and on two occasions he was given the Gustavus Myers Human Rights Award. Now today he will be reading from and discussing his most recent book, Shakespeare, Einstein, and the Bottom Line, The Marketing of Higher Education, which was published last year in Harvard University Press. Excerpts from this book appeared in numerous publications around the country uh, during the uh, past few years, but I think it's fair to say that when this book appeared last year, it was a major publishing event for higher education in the country. For over a century, and maybe more, uh, critics of higher education have bemoaned the cash nexus that seems to have infiltrated the academy, but no one to my knowledge or no other author has demonstrated how pervasive money has become in higher education, maybe because money has not been quite as pervasive in higher education as it has in the last, um, in the last few years. So I'm immensely pleased to introduce to you David Kirp and eager to hear what he has to say about his book. Interviewing Professor Kirp will be John Levine, who received his BA in English from Oberlin College and his MFA in uh, playwriting from San Francisco State University. He's been teaching in the college writing program since 1997. His plays have been produced and workshopped in Northern California and on the East Coast. His compositional research has been published in the National Writing Project quarterly. So without further ado, David Kirp and John Levine. Thank you for those kind words. Um, I thought I'd read a, a a bit from the last book that I wrote, and then a bit from Almost Home. Um, and since we're in Berkeley, um, I want to read you a chunk of a piece um, about the Berkeley Hills fire. Um, um, the piece is called Ironies in the Fire. Um, after the Berkeley-Oakland conflagration, a man-made nightmare. Um, standing in the fourth story tower of his startling new home, his untamed beard flying off in every direction. Psychotherapist Michael Lesser resembles an Old Testament prophet looking out over the promised land. His house is one of nearly 3,000 newly built in the hills of Berkeley and Oakland, California, not as part of a planned development, but rather one by one on three square miles reduced to ashes in October 1991 by one of the most destructive wildfires in the nation's history. The fire raged for three days. Before it leveled the pine and eucalyptus trees, thick foliage blocked all but the minutest of views from what was then the Lesser's home. Now the vista is almost unimpeded, and Michael Lesser finds himself pleased by the distant and ennobling sight of San Francisco Bay. It was God, he said, during one of my many visits to these charred hills who gave us a magnificent 360 degree view. And skipping some of the piece for another part of that tale. 
boxes, monster houses, motels, houses on steroids, mushrooms springing up in charcoal, factories, trailers, visual indigestion, icons of kitchature, it's no end to the catalog of insults, printable and otherwise, appended to these new constructions. An inviting hillside of winding roads, thick foliage, and informal houses has been transformed at a cost of more than a billion dollars into the kind of place that nobody supposedly wanted, a variation on the grandiose theme of Black Hawk, the impact of excess only magnified by the denuded landscape. If any corner of the burn zone should by rights have escaped so dismal a fate, it's the Berkeley neighborhood where Michael Lesser lives with his fire-made 360-degree view. Elsewhere in the hills, people reported meeting their neighbors for the first time as they picked through the wreckage, but the families who lived near the intersection of Alvarado and Vicente Roads were hardly strangers. They had keys to one another's houses. They gossiped about and would say they looked after one another. Over the years, some of them became intimate friends. They were drawn together as well by the recognition that they lived in an ecologically fragile place that obliged them to act together as a neighborhood. In 1978, several of these families joined in the purchase of three acres of land in the middle of the neighborhood, preserving a swath of open space as a, quote, sacred space. The rules for designing new homes established by the Berkeley Planning Commission after the 1991 fire seemed tailor-made for this little group of neighbors. Berkeley normally requires a public hearing before issuing a building permit, even if no one objects to the plan, a facet of Berkeley-style socialism, life in a world of endless meetings. But in a rush of sympathy for the refugees, this requirement was waived. Residents were made sovereign, given the authority to pass judgment on their neighbor's designs. The lower stretches of Alvarado Road were untouched by the fire. But as the road makes a wide curve half a mile or so into the hills, the trees and underbrush abruptly disappear. The rambling three-story stucco house owned by Tony Garrett and her husband, Jean Farb, straddles that border. The firestorm leveled their detached garage, destroyed their landscaping, and tossed burning embers onto their slate roof. But the house itself survived. Even as the construction began all around them, the Farbs put, up their own, put, put off their own rebuilding. They are busy shoring up their financially troubled business. Whole Earth Access, a chain of stores imbued with a Zenish philosophy of Stuart Brand's Whole Earth catalog. Besides, their house was intact, and they didn't feel the same urgencies as those who had been burned out. Although they had been among the last families to move into the neighborhood, they were glad to serve as nurturers to the newly dispossessed. After the fire, a once-and-future neighbor was often on the premises, sharing an impromptu meal, swapping notes about children, discussing plans for rebuilding. When the Farbs, sorry. It was natural, Tony, Farb, Tony Garrett told me as we sat in her reinvented garden, that she and her husband would take on deep feelings for everyone else's losses. In a world suddenly fissured between those whose houses were destroyed and those whose houses still stood, all attention flowed to the victims of fate. Before the conflagration, the Farb's comfortable house had been the biggest in the neighborhood. No longer across the street, the residents of Michael and Deborah Lesser grew story by story over two long years of construction, a Berlin Wall shedding off the old from the new. The neighbors mostly despised it, and even architect Stanley Sadowitz has scarcely a good word for the result of his own design. The idea in the beginning was to build something modest, he said when I spoke to him in his modernist San Francisco office. But Michael kept wanting to add more, an extra room in the side of the house, a couple of rooms downstairs, places that could be rented out. Though his old house was generic arts and crafts, nothing remarkable architecturally, he convinced the insurance company it was the Parthenon, and so he had the money to do what he wanted. When the Farbs had been asked to approve their neighbor's design for rebuilding, they never once raised an objection. The Lesser's house across the street was too big, they felt. The tower on the new Tuscan-style home of their next-door neighbors, the Walrods, too imposing. But those people had suffered enough. What they wanted to do was fine. Yet when it, came the, when it was the Farb's turn to seek the approval of their neighbors for their own modest rebuilding of a garage and game room, Michael Lesser vetoed the design. It was bad enough from his point of view that someday the pine trees planted at the suggestion of a feng shui practitioner would intrude on the Lesser's newly attained view. But it was infinitely unacceptable. 
that the Farbs plans called for a structure six feet higher than the old garage. Michael Lesser makes a dogged and unpleasant adversary. A few years before the fire, he had complained that his then neighbor had built an extension to his home a few feet beyond the legal setback and demanded noisily, if fruitlessly, that it be torn down. Lesser's objections to the Farb's garage, coming at the last possible moment after nine months of planning, presented a major inconvenience. At first, Tony Garrett was, as she said, angry enough to slug it out. But after a few weeks of reflection, she and her husband decided they weren't inclined to pursue struggles. Construction was postponed, and the architect went back to the drawing board. Several months and several thousand dollars later, a new design emerged. Tony Garrett wrote to the lessers, asking them to help defray the added cost, but they never responded. And the Farbs were unwilling to press the matter further. Too much trouble, they believed. Too much bad karma. Besides, the lesser's daughter had grown up with their son. They didn't want adults' arguments to complicate their children's lives. Not long after the lessers moved into their new home, Tony Garrett organized a 50th birthday party for Deborah Lesser. She'd settled into her new home, Deborah told her neighbors, even though its austere geometries didn't offer a single quiet corner where late at night she could curl up with a book. She wanted to stay there forever. She'd had a garden before the fire, Deborah reminded her friends, and it was time to start a new one. She'd really appreciate the gift of a tree, something that would grow with the new house, and so the neighbors gave her gift certificates to pay for landscaping. The months slip into years, and the landscaping still isn't done. The lesser's property remains unkempt. They can't see the ugliness from their own house, so acutely angled are the windows. But Tony Garrett and Jean Farb see it and recoil every time they look across the street, and so does everyone else who passes by. So that's a little slice from Berkeley. Um, we can talk about the reaction of the, the subjects of that piece if you'd like. Um, so now I, I switch to a, a somewhat more um, impersonal, I suppose, topic, um, the marketing of higher education. Um, and I begin the book uh, where my own journey uh, began, um, in a place that I invite you to figure out. The two campuses are half an hour's drive and a psychological light year removed from each other. Between them, they mark the outer boundaries of the new higher learning in America. One is a modern rendering of the Ivy College, a place of learning set apart from the humdrum world. The other, the verdant landscape, camouflaged from neighboring office parks, is a real park dotted with ponds and meandering trails, setting that invites conversation among students and teachers. The buildings are unobtrusively contemporary, and the classrooms, many of them seminar-sized, are wired for the electronic age. This is a highly selective school which draws its students and its faculty from around the globe. Students report that they are pleased with their instruction, as well as with the opportunity to make the kinds of contacts that make careers. The other campus is a faux Gothic refuge from a dicey urban neighborhood, Oxford amid the ghetto. But until recently, the telltale signs of neglect were everywhere evident, from the physics lab, state-of-the-art circa 1950, to the swimming pool used to train competitors for the Olympics, the 1908 Olympics, that is. Throughout its history, the institution has regularly been in financial trouble. Twice in earlier years, it came close to moving away, and its annual deficit, projected to run $10 million, was eating away at its relatively modest endowment. While its alumni have always been fiercely loyal, many were saying the place was so brutal they wouldn't want to send their own children there. Among new attracting new students had become harder and harder. More than 60% of those who applied were admitted to the class of 2000, and fewer than a third of those who were accepted actually enrolled. The second of these schools is the University of Chicago. Uh, the first is Hamburger University, McDonald's corporate training headquarters. Now, to speak of McDonald's and the University of Chicago in the same breath is blasphemy, at least at Hyde Park. But the rise to prominence of schools like Hamburger U, not your father's higher education, certainly, but an accredited institution nonetheless, as well as the hard choices that confront a quintessential academy of higher learning like Chicago, illustrate a much larger phenomenon. For better or worse, for better and worse, really, American higher education is being transformed by both the power and the ethic of the marketplace. 
It is this story that is recounted in the book, the strategies devised to navigate this complex market terrain, as well as the values of university life that those strategies place at risk. Um, and let me read one other um, brief passage, uh, a little story, since this is sort of admissions time, this is sort of, a, sort of an admission story. Um, section is called Identity Theft in a chapter called This Little Student Goes to Market. Um, until recently, Beaver College, just outside Philadelphia, was losing badly in the competition for students. School used to be a women's liberal arts college, a cut below the Seven Sisters, but as that niche vanished in the 1970s, it suffered from what one longtime faculty member describes as an ongoing identity crisis. With enrollment dropping and an endowment of just $400,000, the school was forced to use deposits sent in by the following year's incoming class to pay off its creditors. In 1972, it started admitting men, lowering its admission standards to do so. And over the next 15 years, it tacked on vocational programs for physician's assistants, physical therapists, and genetic counselors, as well as an associate's degree program open to anyone who could pay. Well, I then go on to say something about how managerialism sets in at the school. Um, and then, to pick up the text, still there remain the ticklish problem of the school's name. Beaver College had been named after the western Pennsylvania County where it was founded in 1853, but pop culture had long since turned an innocent animal into a double entendre. Nice beaver, says Leslie Nielsen to the latter, climbing Priscilla Presley in the naked gun. Thanks, she replies, bringing a taxidermied animal into view. I just had it stuffed. The, the new uh, hire, the new vice president, began lobbying for a name change the moment he arrived. The name scared off prospective applicants, he argued, and the internet content filters and many high school computers even blocked them from accessing the college's website. <laughs> Companies give themselves new names all the time, so why not a school? But once the news of the pending name change was leaked, TV talk show hosts like Jay Leno and David Letterman had a field day. Unwelcome um, suggestions poured into the office of Bette Landeman, Beaver's longtime president. How about Gyna College, one wag suggested, or um, University of the Southern Region? <laughs> Landman hired a firm of marketing consultants to come up with a name that would, as she puts it, reflect the brand. That meant something short and punchy, its first letter coming at the beginning of the alphabet to ensure early mention in college guidebook listings, something pleasing sounding, easy to say and read, something Landman said that could become a strong trademark. Arcadia University emerged as the winner among the focus groups, which the school, at the behest of the marketing firm, turned to inspiration. The name evoked pastoral images. Artistic in a pretty setting, observed one focus group member, and sounds like a fun place to be. Similarly, the college became a university because the focus groups liked university better, it sounded more serious. Nostalgic alums plumped for University of Gray Towers after the campus's historic first building, but the focus groups thought that name made the school sound like a prison or a graveyard. <laughs> Still, tradition had to be part of the brand. The name change had to reflect the new while not discarding the virtues of the old. New t-shirts reflected the marketer's solution, Arcadia University since 1853. But what does this altered identity signify? To set itself apart, the school currently promotes the fact that it sends many of its freshmen on a heavily subsidized week-long trip to London over spring break. This London preview is just the sort of gimmick that a consultant might concoct, Arcadia equals fun. But at a school chronically strapped for funds, what is the message about academic priorities? Arcadia University was able to laugh off the criticisms and witticisms when, after changing its name, it found the number of applicants jumped by a third. In the fall of 2002, there were more than 500 freshmen, the biggest class in the school's history. Inadvertently, says President Landman, the fact that our own name was the butt of many jokes meant that people across the country and outside the country heard the fact that we were changing our name. That was unexpected marketing. Um, before we begin... Subtitle of the book is marketing, right? Right, that's true. That's right. We, we, have to, we, we have to do our own marketing here. 
Um, before we begin, I want to start with a confession. And it's going to be my confession, not your confession. When I heard that you were, you can confess if you want to. Um, when Wrong I heard religion. that you were going to be the Berkeley writer at work as part of the series, and I, had, I was very interested in your book, I was so excited. I, I, I knew I was going to read this book. I knew it would be a great opportunity to talk to you. And I read the book, and then I realized that you'd written 14 books. And so I knew I had to do a little bit of homework. And the, the other thing was, you're a public policy professor, and I do not know anything about public policy. That said, I dove in. I didn't read all 14 books. There's the confession. But I did find that your, your writing was so accessible, so reader-friendly, so narrative-driven. So my question is, is that, is that what public policy writing is? is it, or, or is that your own stamp? This is a rather daunting-looking pile here that you've... Uh, that you've collected. I sometimes wonder who wrote all that stuff. Um, uh, not usually. Um, I sometimes think that the way I get away with this is because there's only one of me around. If, there were, if this became a field, somebody would, uh, somebody would worry. But I've always thought that um, the job of somebody in a field that is, after all, called public policy is to reach both a policy maker audience, um, a real people audience, folks who actually go into bookstores like Black Oak or Cody or the bookstore here on campus and buy books, um, as well as my colleagues. Um, so, and I think that stories are a really good way of getting um, themes, ideas across. I think, I think many people start with a particular, start with a story and work their way out to something um, broader, than, broader than the story. Um, and I know, having, having been once upon a time a lawyer and more recently a journalist, um, stories seem to stick. So um, that's, the, that's the rationale. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And does it translate into your more academic uh, geared writing? Would you say that that narrative thrust t works its way into your academic writing? Not that this is an academic writing. Well, but here's, the, here's the secret. I mean, for the, I actually didn't want to include numbers in the text, but there are whatever, 50 pages worth mm. of footnotes sitting here. Um, so that for somebody who wants to take this as a as sort of an account of what higher education <coughs> policy is like and the ways market forces work, and really go read the stuff that I read, they can read the economics and the politics and the, and the organizational literature. It's there. Um, I think my favorite sort of compliment from an academic, she had read the piece from the Berkeley Hills piece and said, that's a really nice piece of literature in the, of social stratification. And I said, it's sort of nice to be able to sort of sneak that in. So the, the idea is to sneak it in um, rather than to hit people over the head with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, if you were to read the journal articles, um, they might not be as story driven, but some of them are. And, They'd be pretty accessible, I hope. Well, I did read one. I read one um, academic article. The title was uh, Cases and Controversies, How Novitiates Are Trained to Be Masters of the Public Policy Universe. Great title, by the way. And I want to talk about I titles like title. in a way. I, yeah, I do, want to, I do want to hear about that. Um, and that as well, I found, I mean, there were certain things that went over my head, but these, these case studies were, in a sense, stories. Is that, is that accurate? I mean, in lay terms? They are stories. And... Um, I, had, I don't think they're very good stories, as that piece suggests. They're very influential stories. Um, they're the way in which um, students learn what this field is about. So with a student, I mean, this is as close to being a POMO critic as I'm ever going to be. I really wanted to unearth, uh, if you pardon the expression, the meta text of these pieces. What's going on here? What do these stories say to folks about what this field is like and what it means to be a success in this field? And so. Uh, we got very scientific about this. We took the top 10 best sellers um, from the Kennedy School series, and they're the most popular of this group, and we analyzed them in terms of, you know, just who's the figure, what's the storyline, you know, what's happening, what are the roles of the different players, how important is analysis in these tales versus sort of pure good guy, bad guy politics. Um, and then, um, because the editor said, well, you know, maybe the market isn't a good enough sample, um, scientifically a good enough sample. We did a random sample from all the cases. Um, same result. So that's the piece that, mm -hmm. that, uh, that you saw. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
as as Dean Hall pointed out, you you have a, a, a you've worn a variety of hats: um, civil rights attorney, university professor for a time, university dean, um, newspaper editor. Do you also have a writer's hat? Do you consider yourself a writer? I do. Um, I I do walk around the world sometimes with a little notepad um, and um, keep a kind of uh, working journal of what's going on. I. I once tried my hand at fiction, and I was working away, and I kept saying to myself, so am I writing fiction now? So is this <laughs> fiction? Um, and I, just, I wasn't any good at it. I mean, I sort of gave it a month. And I, I'm, because I really, what I like to do is hear what people have to say and learn about the world that way. Um, and making it up was not as, a, as appealing a thing to, uh, to do. But getting it, I mean, getting it right, um, getting the texture, the tone, the ideas right is, is very important to me. And in that sense, I'm very much a writer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm, you don't have to talk about this if you don't want to, but I'm curious about your fiction piece, even though it was only a month long. <laughs> I think that your, your, the nonfiction that you write is so, and now we have this, this genre of, of um, creative nonfiction, that you would be a great fiction writer. Um, so what happened? What, what, why did you decide it just wasn't for you? Well, I, I remember I, I did a piece um, that's actually in uh, Almost Home, the book that I was reading from, uh, about a um, gay black teenager with AIDS in the late 1980s mm -hmm. in the southern mm -hmm. town. And um, I was on the phone talking to him. He'd moved from the, pla from, from the town where he'd done really well. He'd actually prospered after it was an incredibly powerful story. And, he actually left the place that he was going to make it and moved back to the place where he was going to fail. And I talked to him and asked him what this was about. He said, you know, on Mr. Rogers, the TV show Mr. Rogers, there's a magic clock, and the clock turns time backwards. And I, I really wish I had that clock, because if I could turn time backwards, I'd go back to where I was. And I heard that, and I thought, I can never write fiction. I can never make that up. That's just too, and that's just much too powerful for me. The mm -hmm. satisfaction of hearing it and also of, of being connected to a real life. It's not just a, a character, but a life is, is too important to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if we can talk a little bit about Shakespeare Einstein. I, I know you've talked a lot about it, and, and it's, it's, um, it's been on the forefront. You are really the pundit du jour. Every time I turn on the radio, someone's talking to you about you know, what's going on. Um, can you, I know you're not a soothsayer, but given what you, what you know from researching this book and given what's going on in California's current economic climate, um, are you optimistic about California's forecast? God, I think that optimism in this context would be kind of a working definition of pangloss, right? <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm not. Uh, and I've actually had a fair amount since the book came out to, to say about um, that, I mean, once upon a time, <clears throat> 44 years ago, uh, California adopted the master plan for higher education. It was the world's gold standard for what public higher education could be about. And the guarantee was anybody who graduated from high school could get into some college, community college, at least state college, state university, University of California. and. Anybody who did well in community college, whatever they'd done in high school, could, could go on to a four-year school. Um, and for many students, there was a great chance to be at a place like this, which was, and I think still is, the best public university of higher learning in the world. Um, well, that promise is dead now. I mean, we're turning away community college mm -hmm. applicants by the score. The state university is doing the same. Community colleges describe themselves as impacted, which I always thought was something that happened to you when you went to the dentist, but <laughs> turns out to be something that happens to you if you're a student trying to get into a, a school that doesn't have room for you. Um, and um, as long as nobody's going to talk about um, taxes, um, I, don't see a, I don't see that story changing. I also don't see any academic or political leader standing up and saying, here's the argument, here really is the argument to be made this. Um, and I, I think that um, those lead academic leaders are so consumed by the task of raising money and of necessity 
not offending the people, whether they be public officials or private donors, who are going to give money, that it's very hard for them to really see the top positions of administration as a bully pulpit to speak at. Um, and so without that, without anybody really talking to parents, to voters, to taxpayers about what's at stake, you know, without anybody making the connection between the outsourcing of jobs and the shutting down of universities in terms of what the sort of investment in the future looks like, um, without any real effective popular champions in Sacramento, certainly in California, I don't see much reason to be optimistic. This place will be smaller, less good in terms of the quality of the faculty because it'll have fewer younger faculty um, and it will attract fewer minority and fewer students from poor and working class families. That's our future. So is the answer to get back to marketing uh, for UC Berkeley to enter into ventures like the Novartis um, project or, I mean, given what we have, what, what, what is the answer? Ah, uh, you're right. If I were, if I really had the answer to this question, I'd go off there, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I, I think part of the, there are multiple sort of parts of answers. One of them is to, is to have a public conversation. I mean, the fact that you've been hearing me on the radio uh, is mostly to do the fact that, that it's, it turns out to be a, a topic that interests folks but that nobody else has had much to say about that's you know, been uh, you know, memorialized in that way. Hasn't reached a, nobody's been writing for or producing TV shows for a broad audience. You know, there was that, that movie that sort of came and went instantaneously, perfect score, now waiting for the video, the sort of eight teenagers who decide they need to get mm -hmm. 800s on their SATs mm -hmm. in order to succeed in high school and sort of what they do to make it happen. That's, that's it by way of movies you know, in this terrain, plus, you know, the animal house country of movies. Mm -hmm. um, so there need to be, I mean, for starters, it would be kind of nice if the presidents of the leading research universities sat down and said, we're going to go out in teams and talk to the editorial boards of the 25 leading newspapers in the country, and we're going to make our case to them. And we're going to go to the NPR stations, we're going to go to the serious general TV stations, and God help us, we're going to go on Jon Stewart. Um, <laughs> which is where uh, I probably get more of my news than I'd like to, uh, <laughs> to admit. Uh, watch the, you know, go to, we'll do the Daily Show, why not? Um, that's part of the answer to the, to the story. Um, and a another part of the, I mean, how do you raise money? Well, we know how university is raising money. It's increasing tuition. Um, and um, the more you raise tuition and don't provide adequate um, financial aid, the richer students get. The more you turn to out-of-state students, the more money you make because out-of-state students bring in market rate tuition, but the less you're being a land-grant university serving your own community. Um, as for deals with industry, um, I try in the book to write about, I, I do write about Berkeley and I do write about Novartis and the problems with a, an arrangement that an effectively rented out the research of an entire academic department to one of the big pharmaceutical companies. But I also write about what I think is a great industry-university collaboration involving uh, the um, semiconductor industry and the electrical engineers, where there's probably even more sort of direction of the research, but where everybody is on the same page, the Silicon Valley folks and the people over in electrical engineering. And the work is open. It's available to, to the world to use. Mm -hmm. And the, the, th the reason that these companies and the government are supporting it is because they figure they can take the product of that research and run with it, and mm -hmm. they can be successful. Whereas when it comes to the, to the Novartis deal, the company thought, we've got to own this. And indeed, they do have to own it because they're investing a ton of money. They also own a chunk of the plant genome, which is why the scientists are so excited about being part of the story. My complaint about Novartis isn't that some research with companies that are going to claim patent rights is conducted. This is now universal. The only reason the story arises in Berkeley is because, you know, this is Mario Savio land and this stuff, you know, in theory isn't supposed to happen here. But, you know, at a, at a, at a place where the business school dean is the Bank America dean of Haas, uh, that's the formal title. Uh, should be not a great surprise. I mean, the, the message really is a pretty subtle one, that a university has got to figure out how to 
strike those deals in which the best use it can make of its research is to bring in money that subsidizes the rest of the institution and those pieces of research that are so important for the world that it's got to find a way of funding them and giving them away and making sure that they're available to everybody. And that's what I fault Berkeley for in the Novartis deal, that it was, it's too blunt, too mm -hmm. blunt an arrangement. So that's a really windy answer to what sounded like a simple question, and it, it's a kind of John Kerry answer, I suppose. <laughs> um, um, which, may, you know, fortunately I'm not running for, for anything. Um, but it says something about how hard the question is and how high the stakes are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm glad that you read a little bit about Berkeley, um, the, the Berkeley fire um, scene. I want to, um, I just want to read a, a couple of paragraphs. This is the introduction from Almost Home. And, uh, and I want to ask you about how Berkeley and California <coughs> figure into your, to your vision. Um, on a warm September afternoon, a few weeks into the fall 1999 term, Berkeley Sproul Plaza teems with life. Students scurry between classes or head toward Telegraph Avenue. The quintessentially Berkeley characters are on the scene. The preacher cajoling, the man with the fake microphone crooning off key, and the drummer pounding away. In this scruffy square, the cultural revolution had its tumultuous start with the free speech movement. But now that seems like ancient history. Mario Savio, the personification of the movement, has been transformed into an icon, his death mourned by a chancellor whose predecessor sicked the police on him. When compared with the 1960s, the occasional protests over the demise of affirmative action or the university's unwillingness to let its teaching assistants unionize are timid affairs. A small circle embedded in the plaza is inscribed with the words, this space is the territory of no nation. But to the oblivious passers-by, that circle with the utopian fantasy that it represents is just part of the pavement. And although you're capturing a scene five years ago, I mean, that's, that's any day on, on Sproul Plaza. So my question again is, do you find that um, your immediate environs, Berkeley, California, figures its way into your writing and, and, and what captures your interest in terms of writing projects? Actually, stories figure their way into my life. I mean, I, something happens, something sparks my imagination. Um, and um, it's either a person or a place, and I try to read a little bit about, about both. So I, when I, this book, um, Shakespeare, um, Einstein, takes place all over the country. Mm -hmm. um, and I really try to immerse myself in place. Place matters. People matter in these stories. I mean, I'm trying to, to draw some common threads, but I don't want to lose the particular. And, and when I write, I will take a camera with me if I'm out interviewing someplace, and I'll take a bunch of almost deliberately bad photographs, and just sort of shots of stuff, mm -hmm. and so that my study will wind up being papered with bad photographs as a kind of you know, remi visual reminder of the who and the what that I'm writing about so that I can put myself back into Mount Laurel, New Jersey, where I spent a couple of years working on what I was doing, or the University of Chicago, or DeVry University down the road, or NYU, or wherever it is that, you know, that, that I am, that, that southern town that I'm, that I'm writing about. So place and people matter, um, and somehow keeping the ideas, it's not hard for me to keep in my head, but I need those as reminders of, of where I am and who I'm with. Well, that it helps explain, not that you don't do it marvelously on, marvelously on your own, but the, the, key, the fine detail that comes out in your writing. I'm curious, how did you come up with this taking pictures uh, approach? I have no idea. Okay. Um, I just wanted, I, I knew that the visual stuff mattered, and I knew that I could sort of write all day, but it would help to be able to actually look up and see it. Um, I mean, you know, East Coast suburban towns look different. And it's easy to forget that. It's easy to think that the place you're at right now is the way the world looks. It's easy to forget how exotic some places are near, when you're there for three days. And so the, the way for me to hold on to that was to take pictures as well as taking notes. Mm -hmm. So the excerpt that you read about the, the fire, did you, did you take pictures of the yeah. people? Oh, yeah. People, place. You said that you be willing to talk about the reaction to that, the response to that piece. Would you talk a little bit about that? I'm curious. Uh, as, as you might imagine, I got what um, policy wonks would call a bimodal response to that piece. Um, the, the lessers and a couple of other 
houses, because I am focusing on real places, and the only way to tell this story was to have real people and real lives and real sets of events. They're there. Um, and it's a magazine piece, not, a, uh, not following the <coughs> sociological conventions of, of not naming places and, and, and people. Um, they were startled because, you know, in this sense, it really is a piece about social stratification. Um, there was no doubt in anybody's mind that they had done absolutely the right thing. They were entitled, is the word that, that they used. Um, and to see what they'd said in print and to see other people's reaction to it was really shocking to them. Um, I got lots of letters from people who didn't rebuild and some who did rebuild on the footprints of their old houses saying, you know, thank you, thank you for doing this because this whole area has been kind of, you know, you know sanctified space, mm -hmm. not allowed to say anything that's at all critical. Um, I had, at, as it, quite as it turns out, uh, I'd agreed to do this. It was originally a magazine piece in Harper's. And three weeks after I agreed to do it, uh, there was a fire in the hills in Inverness uh, in Point Reyes, uh, consumed 2,500 acres and 60 houses. I had a house there that was burned down in that fire. So I had a particularly interesting relationship to this story because I was trying to think about who I w was I going to be, you know, Tony and Jean, or was I going to be the lessers, you know, as I tried to struggle with my own fire as I'm writing about this tale. One thing that just struck me as amazing about that story, this is a fabulously liberal part of the world, right? I mean, you know, there is, you know, what counts as conservative here, you know, wouldn't, you know, every, even appear on the ballot except for the label, label socialist in Idaho, right? <laughs> uh, and I said to people at this point, there was a lot of empty land and people weren't building there in the early 90s. So it really was a buyer's, you know, you could, you could, you know, there was just lots of room. And I said, what about building vest pocket, small, you know, affordable housing, you know, garden, you know, low garden apartments, cottages, what have you, something that sort of fits the place. And the reaction wasn't a sort of serious argument about why or why not. It was people sort of thinking I'd come from Mars. And it's just such an unthinkable idea that you might actually do that. And that told me a lot about the, about the place and what the assumptions were about the mm -hmm. place. It was, it was the ultimate NIMBY, not in my backyard story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to make sure we have time to talk about your writing and your writing process. Um, so um, uh, let's get to that. As you sit down to write, a piece, say, for Shakespeare, Einstein, or Almost Home, do you have a reader in mind? Do you have an audience in mind that you're writing for? Um, I have audiences in mind. Um, I, want it, I want it to be that a chapter to be sort of readable by anybody who comes by um, in my life while I'm working on, on writing. Um, you know, that's, and if I'm up in Inverness, it's, you know, the builder with a college degree or some family member or somebody on campus or, or what have you. Um, I, I don't have, you know, there's not a person in my head. Um, I think mostly what I have in my head is strunk and white, um, <laughs> elements of style. I mean, clear, active voice, you know, there's not a lot of Latinate as opposed to Anglo-Saxon. English in this stuff, not a lot of adjectives, verbs matter. So I mean, all of that really meant to be, how do you tell a story that ordinary people can grab hold of um, and read? And although, um, you know, and, and a lot of, uh, I've just finished reading an Ethan Kanan novel. You know, I think of somebody like Ethan Kanan or very differently, um, Ann Tyler. They're, they're very simple writers. I mean, deceptively simple writers. Mm -hmm. The prose is very straightforward. There's nothing especially fancy. You don't say, oh my god, they're writing. Um, and that's the hope of this, of, of this work, that it's supposed to, it is meant, you're not supposed to see me working. You're not supposed to say, oh my god, look what he just did. You're just supposed to be carried along in the, in the story. And when I, con in constru this was the hardest book that I've ever done. Because um, almost home, it's really a series of separate pieces which get woven together around a 
theme of, of the power and fragility of community in America. Um, and it's a theme that I discovered in my own work. I didn't set out to have a career writing about communities in America, but did. This didn't have, each, each chapter, there's a different bit of learning. So I've got to learn about, you know, the worlds of biotech and high tech for one chapter. I've got to learn about how for profit universities function. I've got to learn about the, this new breed of marketers out there. I have to make sense about these superstar faculty members. You know, what is it, what's going on when, you know, um, Cornell West is feuding with uh, Larry Summers at Harvard and it's page one news. And each of those required me to read a different literature, absorb a different literature, and then somehow translate that into the kind of straightforward prose that I was in, engaging in. So it was a killer of a process. Um, and it was, a, it was a pretty straight ahead process. I just, you know, I knew that if I ever stopped, you know, you know for a long stretch of time, it would be very hard to pick up that momentum. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. In both Almost Home and Shakespeare Einstein, you have various anecdotes that add up to, to one big thesis. Do you know as you're writing, okay, this, this piece is going to go and here and this one will follow that? And because it seems like there is a distinct order that we couldn't switch things around. Um, are you aware of that as you're putting together the pieces? Um, it's, it's interesting that you say that. I mean, Almost Home was written as, as quite discrete pieces over a long stretch of time. And we went through a bunch of different organiz organizations. Um, I mean, here's the secret. I, in that piece, I, I, if the right word of saying this is, I bury in the middle the stuff that I think is probably least accessible. So that if the reader is going to pick the book up, she's going to start at the beginning and maybe sort of be kept ongoing and or start at the end is, you know, some people who really think that English and Hebrew are the same language and sort of <laughs> work their way backwards. But so there's this stuff around chapter eight. Um, and I, I'd actually do that here. But for, for Shakespeare, Einstein, um, I didn't even know what the cases were going to be. When I began working on this book, dot com was all the rage. And it was the rage in higher education. And every university was opening its for profit. And every university was going to make a trillion dollars from what it was that it was doing. And I was just scared to death that I'd pick the wrong dot com to write about. And by the time the, you know, the, the page was printed out, it would have died and another one would have replaced it. And you know, that was then, this is now, this is a book that sort of bridges that period of great expectations and sobering realities. Um, so I knew, I knew what a case was, what a story was, the way Potter Stewart knew obscenity. I mean, I knew it when I saw it. And I sort of figured it out. If I went back and looked at the proposal that I sent off to the Ford Foundation to get some money, none of those cases, I think literally none of those cases are in here because I, you know, the, the world changed as I saw it. I guess Chicago was in there, but other than that, mm -hmm. other than the University of Chicago, everything was new. And there were a number of different ways of organizing this book. And this one finally seemed to work better than, than others did. And again, the theory of, the, one version of the theory of the organization is you begin with stuff that people are familiar with. So you begin with, you know, this little student goes to market because everybody has either been a student or is a student and can get what that's about. I mean, it's April, it's admissions time. People know what that's about. So to get told, for example, that if you applied to a private university for early decision, the chances of getting, you, that was worth 100 SAT points to you, the admissions office. And you were going to get a whole lot less money if you were applying for financial aid than if you stuck it out till April and why that would be true, but that would interest folks. Now, that would interest lots of folks. And people get interested in the sort of stuff about, they knew about superstar professors and the likes. So you start there and then hope you've enticed the reader enough to take him or her into the kind of wilder reaches of distance learning and you know, international higher education and the whole you know, high tech business and the industry university stories, all that seemed to make some sense and I would get to a point and then carry on running. So it's, it's great to know that it feels like, um, you know, it was the natural and inevitable process because it sure, it sure wasn't. So it was an accident. Well, it wasn't an accident. But oh, no, it was, of, yeah. you know, lots of sweat equity. Uh, after we're, just gen more generally speaking, after you finish a book and things are put together, do you say, oh, that chapter should have been there, that chapter, do you agonize over things like that? No. No, it's done and it's, it's what it is. Um, Sometimes I read stuff and I say, you know, God, did I, did I really write that? And I say, oh, God, did I really write that? So, um, but, you know, th this stuff goes through lots and lots of drafts. And the great thing about a book is that, 
you know, you have stretches of time. You really do get to put it down, pick it up again. So the book goes off to Harvard Press, and then it's gone. And a very good friend who is a, a development editor, uh, a phrase that many folks probably don't know, but basically she's someone with whom I worked about on questions like structure and, you know, structure of argument. You know, does this work? Does this section of this chapter work? Does this sequencing of chapters work in this? And I could let it sit there and come back to it and, and revisit it. Um, but I don't agonize. I'm a, I'm a pretty fast writer, and a lot of the best stuff is, is sort of early, you know, comes quickly. So what you get here is a sort of layering of, you know, second, third, fourth, fifth draft, depending upon the part of what's, of what's there. Okay, that was my next question, and when you used that word draft, I, I could hear ears pricking up, if you can hear that. Um, is there a number of drafts that you, you go through? Is there an average number of drafts? Um, are some, do some pieces go through two, some pieces go through 10? You know, I, 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 when I was working on this, or when I'm working on anything, I like to share it with students in a seminar or what have you, so people don't, this is a pretty, in, I mean, for, for a would-be writer, this is pretty intimidating. I mean, it's got a cover, it's got binding, it's printed. I mean, it, it, looks, it looks perfect, right? And only those of us who've been through it know how, what it takes to get from, from here to there. So is there an average number of iterations? No, sometimes the story comes very speedily. And I, so the Beaver College story that I read, I just, I wrote that basically straight through. Um, some, of the, some of the pieces, um, the piece on uh, what's called a good deal of collaboration, the piece on the I t the high-tech and biotech Berkeley stories. That took a long time to get right, and it's probably the chapter that I'm least satisfied with. But, you know, it just, it just, it, it depends, and I'm not even sure I can tell you what it depends on. In that case, I knew less about biotech and about IT, substantively, than I did about anything else in the book. And I really felt I had to learn enough to know that I at least wasn't making a fool of myself substantively. Because mm -hmm. I was going to make an argument that said, it's really important that you understand the structure of knowledge of biotech and why ownership matters and why IT is, a, is Microsoft to the contrary notwithstanding. Mostly the race goes to the swift, not to the owners. But I really, you know, to get there and to feel as though I had some command over that, that was, the, that was very tough to, to do. Whereas when it comes to professors as entrepreneurs, I mean, you know, hey, I live among them you know, mm -hmm. all the time. I was a dean for a while. I understand that spring is known as the season, season of greed and why that might be true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk a little bit about how you write. Uh, when do you write? Is it the same time every day? Do you write every day? No. No. I write, I tend to write best in the morning. Um, um, and reasonably, early, I mean, on a, on a real, and, and in a real writing role, and this book was certainly a writing <laughs> role, and um, as has sort of often been the case, and just sort of months are sort of, I wind up sort of being done with term and, and large chunks of stuff get done in the summer. Um, I'll get up early, go run or something, come back, have a little breakfast, uh, look at the newspaper, and then sort of sit down early uh, and maybe be done by 1.30 or 2 in the afternoon in time for lunch. And, maybe be reading or reading over what I've done or whatever, but that's the sort of eight to one would be a, would be a really good day for me to be able to, to put in. Um, there were times this, that summer a year ago when I was working on this, that I was, you know, day I would actually write for 10 and 12 hours of the stretch. Uh, and I don't know where that came from. It just was, part of it was, you know, if you've got a little writer's cabin in the middle of it's beautiful woods. It's just, it's, it's somehow, it's a very attractive setting in which to sort of be working. And I'd look up and I'd see green and I was hiding out from the, from the bay and I'd sort of emerge like this little mole into daylight and I'd look out and there was the bay and I'd come back to my little room and I'd, I'd work some more. But it just happened. Um, it was, that process was almost trance-like in, in the way it felt. I was just sort of going with whatever was happening. And I trusted it enough not to, not to try to sort of analyze what I was doing.
so when you say you wrote for 10 to 12 hours or even writing for four hours, is that sitting there and writing? Well, I didn't even ask if you write on a computer or longhand. Are you really writing or, and I, I mean, I'll just confess, when I say four hours, I actually get an hour's worth of writing done. Do you get distracted? Do things interrupt? No, not much. Um, I, I sometimes, I, I was in Bali a long time ago and, and remember seeing the trance dancers and thinking that I just didn't know how they did that. Um, you know, how do you go walk on hot coals? But to some extent, I was just I really am in another world when I'm working on stuff. And I used to be uh, a newspaper editor. I used to, to write editorials and columns. And the phone would ring, and I'd be in the middle of writing something, and I'd talk to someone, I'd hang up. And I can, st and I can do that. I mean, that skill sort of, so it's not as though, you know, I've got to wear the earplugs and sort of disappear from the, from the world, but I'm, but I'm very focused on what it is that I'm, that I'm doing. Um, nor do I have, I don't have a number of pages. Um, mm -hmm. I do mostly, I, I work, I start with the yellow pad which has stuff scribbled on it all over the place and I've never been able to really make a working outline online because that's not how my mind works. It has all these little arrows and whatever is going on. And, um, but then, you know, there's sort of a next step which is a sort of, I don't know, eight, ten lines worth of stuff. And then I'm sitting there at the computer and I'm writing away. And uh, back in the typewriter days, I mean, it used to be that I, if I couldn't get the first paragraph right, I'd never go on. And so the garbage pail would just be overflowing with crumpled pieces of, of paper. Now, for better and worse, on the computer, I mean, you never see typos on the computer, right? I mean, if you do, you know, it's not that, you know the, tyrant, the tyrants of the you know, the, the, the correcting little device will give, that little, give you that little red line and I leave it in there just to remind myself. But text looks perfect. Um, and to some extent, it's, it's, I think, emboldened me to sort of carry on and write, sort of keep writing. I don't necessarily start at the beginning and work to the end. Um, um, in fact, it's all, the beginning often is the last thing that I wind up doing in a, in a, in a piece. And certainly in this, that passage you read was the last thing that I wrote um, in, um, in writing Almost Home. It just, because it was, it was very near the end of the time that I was working on the book. And it's a piece that takes place at a time when all those, st all those clubs are, are, tro are trolling for members in Sproul Plaza, 120 odd folks that, are, and I sort of went out there. Then I went downstairs, stuck my head in downstairs to, you know, the land of electronic games. And I thought, it's a really interesting contrast. I mean, if you want the tension between community and you know, and, and, you know, don't bother me, world, there it was, you know, one right on top of the other, and the image is sort of there and came to me and got written about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You said you carry around a notebook sometimes. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you now or have you ever kept a journal? Do you call that a journal? <laughs> yeah, I love that. Do you now or have you ever? <laughs> yeah, I have from time to time. But it's not an, an ongoing thing? You don't have journals going back it 20 isn't. years? It isn't. I wish it were. I, the, the, the best of these journals probably was written 25 years ago when I was in Jerusalem for about six months. Um, and I really do want to go back to that journal because it was a magical moment when, you know, you could have Jewish and Arab friends. You could walk around the old city. You could hang out in Jericho. You could, you know, you could do what you could do. You could sort of live in, in, in a country with the illusion of some degree of normality. And I haven't read that journal over and it seems as though there ought to be something there that's worth revisiting at least in my mind and maybe in maybe in writing about so I could wish there was more stuff on paper than there is. So have there been articles books that have come out of journal musings or or, or things that you there really I haven't I've I've it's a funny the typical ac the typical academic approach is to say I'm going to work on housing economics and so you build layer by layer in the field that you're working on. Or I'm, I'm doing, you know, medieval English history. You take up this now and this later. And, and I've never done that. I've always been sort of captive of something that sort of grabbed me along the way. I mean, I think what got me to write this book was a moment, really was a moment on campus when I was, when I was um, the dean of the policy school for the better part of a year. And, um, went off to my first meeting of the Council of Deans and the then provost led a conversation um, about the proper and improper uses of the university seal 
went on for about a half an hour. Um, and I was so naive that I sat there in a state of perplexity because I knew that our mascot was the bear and not the seal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I realized that it was a different kind of seal that she was talking about. And, you know, uh, this really was a different kind of university than the one that I knew well. Do you have certain needs when you write um, besides a, a bucolic setting? I mean, coffee, tea, something else? Um, do you have, as part of your ritual, that you have to have? I really am not a, a creature of habit in that sense. As I said, I do best when I've done something, take a walk, go to the gym, whatever, first thing in the morning. Uh, I certainly need some coffee in my system. Um, and. I probably do best if writing is the second thing I've done, if I read a newspaper just to get a sense of something else in the world, rather than just sitting down cold and turning on my mind and the first thing it's doing is sort of being asked to pick up what I'm, what I'm working on. Um, but as I said before, when I describe sort of what hours are like, sometimes it's two, three, four hours, sometimes it's 12 hours, and I've, I know enough about myself. I, it does not work for me to write every day whether or not I have something to say. That, that kind of discipline, which I know some writers swear by, does not work. Um, I know when I'm going to be able to write, when I'm not going to be able to write, and um, I trust that. And I, I think I know the answer to this next question, but do you enjoy the writing process, or are you in such a trance that you're numb and you're not feeling anything? Or do you really thrive on that being in that zone of writing? When I get it right, you know, when, I, when something, some image comes clear, some idea comes clear, I really have sorted my way through some complicated argument. I've got some, I, I've understood something about a character that I didn't know when I sat down. And I should say that I, I've, I've never written anything where I knew the answer and I was just sort of writing it out. That would be, because it's kind of like, it's not a lot of fun to that process. But that getting it right part of it, both stylistically and intellectually, is, is a lot of fun. I mean, what isn't fun is the fourth draft. Because by then, I get to a point in which I say one of two things. Either, usually it's everybody knows, this is just trivial, everybody knows this. You know, why am I bothering to do this? this I don't have anything to say about this stuff. And I'm, I'm just, and I'm tired of me at that point. I just like it to go away. And fortunately, that's often a time when I can put the manuscript away and come back to it sometime down the road. So at the, whatever it is, fourth draft, fifth draft, when does someone else read your writing? Do you have someone that you trust, a, a colleague, a friend, who reads your writing and gives you feedback? I love having people read my writing. And um, pretty early on in the process, it just it depends on what I'm working on. But I mentioned this, this friend editor of mine. I've known Rhea since our days at the Sacramento Bee, which is a long, you know, mid-late 1980s. Um, and she's read lots of the stuff that I've done. If I'm doing magazine and newspaper things, I've been lucky to have great editors uh, to work with, and at Harvard, I had a very good um, editor. Um, friends, different friends read different chunks of stuff here at Berkeley and elsewhere. Um, and I mean, what I've learned as a reader, I've learned as a writer, which is if somebody asks me to read something, I'll ask them, what do you want to hear from me? What do you want to know? What kind of a reading do you, do you want? And I will tell folks, look, I'm not ready to hear about you know, the details of style, et cetera. I wonder if any of this is making sense. I want to know what big problems you're having. I want to know, you know what your arguments are with what's going on. I want to know what's, what's working, what's not working. Um, and um, I, I thrive on the feedback. I don't hold on to stuff until late on in the, mm -hmm. in the process. Mm -hmm. I welcome the, that stuff. But you do give them some sort of direction in terms of what you're looking for in, in Well, I'll tell them where I am. I'll tell them what I'm giving you as a first draft, and I'd really appreciate you know, your take on whether I'm heading off in a direction that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, I mean, there's not a lot of investment yet in this. So you can tell me that this is just junk, and I'll stop working on it and be fine. I don't want to, you know, whereas sort of like, you know, four drafts down the road, I want to hear something about the structure of how this is working and whether I persuaded you on this point or that point. But I, you know, I'm not sure what I would do with a why did you bother to write that book kind of an argument at that point. Well, that's what Harry, I wanted to ask. not being you know, an interesting option. <laughs> do you ever get uh, feedback that is not going to be useful to you? And how do you set that aside? Are you able to do that to discern 
good feedback from not so good feedback? Or useful feedback, I should say. Well, you get rejection slips. Uh, that's feedback. Um, and um, you get publishers that don't want to publish your books. You get magazines that don't want to publish your articles. And that's, that is part of the game. I mean, I think if you, someplace along the way, I've had to learn to be tough enough to accept that that was what the price of the ticket of admission was. If you wanted to be heard by folks, there are going to be folks who, for whatever reason, didn't want to hear you. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to argue back to those folks. Um, I really, I mean, I, I really like it when, whether it's before the manuscript is done or after it's been published, I like hearing, value hearing in, intelligent, smart critiques of what I've done. Um, what, you know, the, the kinds of criticism that I suppose um, stick, in, stick in my mind are those where um, somebody obviously has an axe to grind and I was the available, you know, whetstone on which to sort of sharpen that axe before they sort of used it. But, um, but you can just recognize that for what it is and shut it out. You're, I guess what I'm getting at is, do your feelings ever get hurt with these rejection slips? Yeah, or, or, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but you know, if I were as, I've, I've said to my friends, if I was, if I was as non-neurotic about all my life as I am about my writing, I'd be in great shape. <laughs> um, it just, it is what it is. I mean, I, I, and you know, there's a, you know, talk about markets. This book, there was a review of this book set for the November 16th issue of the New York Times, not that I remember that date. And um, <laughs> the uh, editor of the book review called Harvard Press and said, whoops, sorry, we just got a full page ad, got to run it because we don't have any money. And so we're taking that review ad. And so the review hung fire, hung fire, you know, until forever. And then, I don't know, a week, week and a half ago, she finally, the Times editor finally contacted the Harvard folks and said, it's just, I guess it's just not going to run. That's sad, you know. It's a, you know, I'd love to see what that person had to say. Nice to have a review in the New York Times. But, you know, that is how that world works. And at the end of the day, there isn't much you can do about it except say, okay, that is how that world works. I, if you try writing something with the thought that you're going to be liked and, you know, everybody's going to want to hear what you have to say, um, unless your name is Dan Brown um, and you're, you're writing about Da Vinci Codes, <laughs> um, you're, you're pretty doomed to disappointment. I had no idea that anybody would be interested in, in, in this stuff. So it's, it's, it's nice when it happens, but it's, it's important not to confuse it with, your, with who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to talk a little bit about your, your teaching, and, and presumably your students are writing um, for you. Do you have certain standards? Um, do you teach writing to your public policy students? Where does writing fit into your, your teaching? Well, uh, we have arguments about um, words like pre-planning. Um, what is pre-planning? You know, I mean, what is? Think about it. Just think about this one. Um, but yes, indeed, when I particularly when I'm working with master students on long papers that they're doing, we'll spend a lot of time talking about what format they want to use. I mean, they're now doing drafts of major projects, so. One assignment is go out there and look at the world of reports and magazine pieces and newspaper stuff and journal articles and you know presentations and tell us the group you know what you want this piece to look like and why and what it's not going to look like and why you picked that as a thing to do and um, I will work on prose I'll work on prose uh, more intensively um, with undergraduates where the prose problems are often more serious and there the sort of my standard approach is to take a paragraph and really you know sort of rip it up in a major way and sort of point out this is going on and this is going on and this is going on and then say okay why don't you rewrite those three paragraphs over there and see what see what happens um, I, I do think that if you can't say it you don't know it um, if you can't write it you don't really understand it um, and so people get evaluated by me and by the world out there on the basis of writing. I mean, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the late lamented senator from New York, was before that maybe the most influential special counselor in the history of the country, he worked for Richard Nixon, and persuaded Nixon to be a social liberal. And he did it, I think, largely on the force of, the, of his wonderful writing. He's a very persuasive writer, very able to, to bring along an audience of, of one. Um, 
And I tell my students, you know, they're working on these projects, you know, I say, here's the thing, nobody has to read this. And they, I mean, this is a shocked reaction. I've been mean, working on this thing for a semester. I said, no, that's not true. I've got to read it. But then again, I'm paid to do that, so that doesn't count. <laughs> uh, the point, and I say to them, you know, you've been consuming good and bad prose all your life up till now. So all of a sudden, you turn into a producer. But just imagine yourself on the other side of the, of the manuscript, that you're reading this thing. You're not just producing this thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do think it works, and I do think it matters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we, I do want to allow some time for questions, but I do have, to, I do have this question for you that I have to ask. Mm. Titles. You said you love titles. When do they come to you? Is it first thing? Is it last thing? Is it while you're writing? And how do you come up with such great titles? <laughs> um, sometimes they happen fast. I mean, Gender Justice, which is one of the books. Is, I mean, that just, it just seemed like it was the right title for that book, and it just was... It just was there. Our Town, um, and because of the fact that Our Town is this sort of 30-year struggle over affordable housing, and there's a chunk of it in Almost Home, in this, in this place in New Jersey, and there's a moment in which the mayor, rejecting this plan for affordable housing, said, and I guess if you folks can't afford to live, can't afford it, you won't be able to live in Our Town. And I had this, you know, I thought, uh, Our Town, Our Town, and there's actually a riff on, on, on the play in the, in mm -hmm. the book, um, it took, I thought it took longer than I'd ever spend to find a, a title to, before we came up with Almost Home. We had endless lists of possible titles. Then I came to this, uh, to this book. Um, if you've ever seen higher education books, they tend to be, you know, they tend to have words like the marketization of higher education or the university and the, you know, or the, you know, the whatever and the, and the whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I had um, written a chapter for this book, it's actually the introduction, called The New You, letter U. Harvard insisted they wanted to call the book The New You. And I said, wait a minute, I'm going to be on the radio, and I'm going to be saying The New You, and people are going to think I'm writing a 1970s makeover <laughs> book. <laughs> no. And I was on an airplane with my partner flying off someplace. And somehow, the beginning of this, which was something like Plato in the bottom line, came up. And from there to Shakespeare Einstein in the bottom line was about five minutes. Um, you know, the rhyme, get the icons, different fields, et cetera. Um, but it, the list of rejected titles um, along the way was, was huge. So sometimes it's fast. Um, last couple of books, it's been incredibly painful. OK. okay. Well, so it's nice process. to, you know, when people say, you know, cool title, it's like your comment about, you know, that organization is just sort of inevitable, I think. Ha, huh, thank goodness, that's great. <laughs> it was worth it. Um, we do have some time for questions from the audience. So um, if you would raise your hand. And I will repeat the questions. So. So the question is how you do your research and separate that from the writing. Well, again, let me talk about Shakespeare Einstein because it was the hardest research project to do. Um, for one thing, I, in many of, a number of these books are co-authored. This book has a number of co-authored chapters. Um, so that both says I collaborate and think that the collaborators, whether they be undergraduates or colleagues ought to be, you know, co-authors or something, depending upon the role they play in the, in the process. Um, and the collaboration is usually around the thinking and interviewing and data gathering part of the story. Um, and in this book, for each chapter, I had a body of knowledge to learn. So either I was gathering the stuff or my collaborator was gathering the stuff. And I would have a literal, you know, postal bin worth of stuff to read for each one of those chapters. Um, and I would do enough reading to, to be able to go out and interview. Um, and I'm not, a, I'm not a tape recorder interview guy. I take very fast notes, which I think only I can read. And there are sort of notebooks worth of these things. And I go back right away and sort of reread them. And, you know, go off into the bathroom between interviews and write little, you know, process notes or kind of the amateur anthropologist's guide to 
to doing research. Um, take out my camera. Um, again, this was because the field work for this book, the, the <coughs> visiting places, the talking to folks, and then the picking up the telephone and carrying on more interviews, you know, went on over a couple of years, and some of these pieces were written up along the way. But I, one of the reasons those pictures were really important was that for a number of these chapters, the work had sort of piled up. There were the interviews that I'd done. There were the interviews that a collaborator or a research assistant had done. There were the materials. And I had to take my bin out in my study and read and try to absorb and make sense and, and write. Sometimes from stuff that was six months or a year old on a theme that I hadn't thought about for that period of time. So to wrap your head around the whole world of for-profit universities like DeVry and Phoenix and what that's about and how those places function, and to just be there for a month, having been out in the field a year earlier for three weeks doing the interviewing, and then switch to, let's say, New York University and the ways in which it recruited superstars for the philosophy department and the kind of what that meant for a department that goes from worst to first in, in five years. It's very, it, it really did involve this very funny kind of compartmentalization of, of mind. Um, I usually start research in any field by talking to somebody. Um, I, I try to find someone who I'm not going to be interviewing substantively for what I'm doing, somebody who knows the terrain. I don't start with Google. I don't start with the library. I start with the conversation. So, so, and the conversation often is, tell me the five or 10 things that you really think I should read. And, and I go off and begin there and then carry on from, from that point on out. Um, it's a pretty messy looking process. Um, um, lots of stuff gets typed onto the computer. If I'm doing telephone interviews, I'm doing those as TypeScript interviews. If I'm doing if I'm reading stuff, sometimes it's Xerox, sometimes I'm typing onto the, onto the, to the laptop. I'm still not fancier about any of this than good old-fashioned word processing, so there are great piles of, of notes that are there, some of them handwritten, some of them on paper along with the Xeroxes that, that I have. That's the, I don't know if it's a process or not, but it's a, it's a sort of, it's a hope. Uh, one of the things that I think it's really, one of the things that's sort of unnerving ab about books is that, and I say this to people who are working on you know, senior theses, master's theses, doctoral dissertations, whatever, nobody really writes a book. People write chapters. You, you have a frame, you have an argument, you kind of know where you're going, but at any one period of time, you really can't contain 300 pages. You can contain 30 pages. So that's what I try to do, is to really Someplace in the back of my head, there are those, the architecture for those 300 pages, but I'm really focused on DeVry, and if you ask me at that moment about Berkeley's biotech deal or Dickinson College and the fate of liberal arts schools, I'm, I'm not going to be there for, for that at all. Yes? If you were uh, one of the 25 residents... I'd, I'd make... Excuse me. Would you repeat the question before the you... The question is, if I were one of those 25 presidents meeting with editorial boards, what would the message be? Um, I, I would elaborate on two themes. Both, I, I, first of all, I'd look for, if you please, the news peg, because editorial boards want to write about something that connects to the world as we're now in it. That's marketing. That's marketing. It's pitching, right? Um, so one thing I talk about is outsourcing. And I mentioned this before, I mean, the connection between jobs going overseas and the fact that we're not, bec for, because of reasons of market pressure, just aren't investing the kind of money that it takes to produce a, a seriously educated citizenry and population. I'd make that argument. I'd move from workforce to, to other aspects of citizenship. But I'd start there because that's where the conversation starts. The other place that I would go is I'd talk about the incredible gap between rich kids and poor kids. Um, I don't think people realize that, for example, when community colleges here increase their tuition from 11 to $19 a unit, that's about $125 a semester. 
that 100,000 fewer students than expected showed up at community colleges. So that's the kind of number that gets people paying attention. Or I'll say, here's a really, really technical thing I want to say to you about <coughs> the chances of rich kids and poor kids to go to college. Smart, d smart poor kids go to college at about the same rate as dumb rich kids. And that's, the, that's my technical sort of, and then I would elaborate on that. And then I would remind people of the data on the 100, 100 or so most prestigious universities in the, in the country. 75% of their students come from the top 25% of the income bracket, and 2% come from the bottom 25% and talk about what that means in terms of, and why that is, why the kinds of the lack of public support for the kind of great public universities and the great public investment in education produces the sort of market behavior that's going to leave a whole chunk of the population behind. So that would be, be the message. Uh, it's been the message. And it's interesting. I get to do this one step removed because so I thought I'd be killed when I wrote this book because it, like, it does name names, as you could tell, and describes institutions. And in fact, I've been really very well received by the people in the higher education establishment. And um, in the middle of next month, I'm off to talk to the presidents, those presidents, actually. There's an organization called the Association of American Universities, which is the presidents of the 60-odd leading research universities. And they meet twice a year. And they bring in one outsider to spend a couple of hours with them. And this spring, I'm their outsider. So I've got to think about how I make that argument to them to actually galvanize them to do something. Because I do think that they could make a difference. Unfortunately, it's 1.30, past 1.30. And that's all the time we have. But I want to thank you for, for joining us today. It's been great. <laughs>